Well, she is an Academy Award winning costume designer for Elizabeth the Golden Age. Now she is back on our screens with another period piece in the latest adaptation of Jane Austen's Emma. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby. This is Alexandra Byrne. And I actually discovered uh, this is not your first time working with a Jane Austen uh, no. adaptation. You uh, actually, uh, back in 1995, I believe, uh, had oh, an adaptation of- my age almost, yes. <laughs> Uh, it was an adaptation of Persuasion. And, it was. You... and, and actually, it was, I found um, it was incredibly interesting. Persuasion was the, the first film I had ever done. Mm -hmm. And I can say truly that I had not got a clue what I was doing. And you just, in that point, you have this fantastic kind of um, naivety, which just means you do it. You fire on your instinct and you plow ahead. And I really didn't know what I was doing. And it, turned out okay, it was fine. It was, there were lots of, you know, happy accidents and things you learn on the way. And it was quite, it was interesting to come back to the period. Um, Emma is a little bit later, but that's sort of academic, you know, fashion had changed very slightly. But I did Persuasion, there was no internet. So I looked back at my research, I dug it out and there were, you know, 35 mil photographs printed that I'd taken in museums. And every image I can remember, it was so hard to find, you know, you had to really scar. Whereas now it's the opposite, we're in, because of the internet, we're inundated with images and it's more about filtering out what is accurate, what is inaccurate, what is, you know, what's going on with the, the deluge you have. And also uh, the film, the way we filmed, the crew, we did Persuasion in six weeks. I had a crew of, I think, about five. You know, we worked in a very different way. No mobile phones, I don't think, you know. So it was very salutary, but actually what it made me, it did push me to realise that... Um, there is a great joy in trusting your instinct and being free of all the kind of the baggage that we accrue as we work for many years and to just kind of just liberate yourself a little bit and think it can be okay and you know since doing persuasion I've got a lot more experience therefore I should be stronger in my in my choices and my beliefs but it was quite it was an interesting exercise and you don't often get to do that yeah and you you've worked extensively uh in period pieces like that. I mean, I know you say Emma is slightly later, but it's a similar time time period there. Um, is there ever a sort of danger or hesitancy to try and like go back and rely on some old trick that worked back for persuasion? Is How do you sort of keep that I mean, but you're fresh? polite and be formulaic about what you do. Um, I think there could be, but I think the reality is that every script is a new adaptation and every director brings their story that they want to tell. And, and part of my job is to help the director visually tell the story they want to tell. Um, and that's, that's fascinating. I mean, I have to say, you know, Regency is not my favorite period, you know, and, but actually I came to really love it doing Emma. I think because, you know, quite often when you're doing a period, you have such a short prep time, you've got so much learning and so much research to do that you're just kind of, you feel like you're, piling, piling, piling through it all. But I did have a kind of a backbone of knowledge, which meant that I could take it to another level and and move on from there. And, um, you know, I've sort of said it was academic that the period is slightly different. What it meant was that the, the skirts became slightly wider, the skirts were more flared on the women. And there was, it was really interesting to understand how they achieved that and what that meant in the buoyancy and the balance in the dresses. So, um, yeah, you know, it's it's yeah. great to come back. And I don't, I don't, no, I don't think there's a tendency to get lazy. You don't have time to be lazy. Everything <laughs> is frightening and to, you know, can I deliver it? So, um, and different challenges, you know, always different challenges. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you about your collaboration with uh, the director, Autumn DeWild, because she started out as a photographer. So she has a lot of, you know, a lot of ideas, I think, about visual language of, of a film. Um, so what were sort of the conversations like between you two in, in terms of finding the specific aesthetic? Well, when I first met Autumn, she had she showed me the, the deck, her, her um, research deck that she used to pitch for the film. And um, they were just beautifully uh, photographed uh, fashion engravings, which were mounted and wrapped in a box and beautifully presented. And the moment she did that, I understood that she she was totally passionate about fabric, color, composition, texture, stationery, everything. So 
So it's a joy to work with a director who is clearly visually so precise and so strong. Um, and Autumn Cave and I, we worked very closely because as I said, our prep was quite short. So we had to collaborate very clearly together to create the world so that, you know, once you're in full prep, you're free to just run into your corners and deliver and, and yet you know this collaboration that you put together. And Autumn, she really, she was so clear that she wanted the humor to come from the story, from the period. She didn't want to impose something and say, we're gonna make this funny. So she really wanted to know how everything was done, what was the etiquette, what was the hierarchy, how they dressed, what were the manners, so that she could bring the comedy from the reality of the situation. Because I think, you know, Emma is a, it's a delicious novel because, because of the way Austin has written it. We, we both watch Emma making the mistakes her, or her judgments and we're there with her. So there's a, there's a kind of, um, there's a deliciousness to it all. And I think, I think Autumn was so keen to deliver that in her storytelling. Um, and also the joy for me, quite often directors in this period, you know, the moment you say the word bonnet, you can see them kind of getting a little bit twitchy and thinking, oh, how do we get rid of them? Whereas Autumn wanted to, you know, it's an example of what she wanted to know about it. So she wanted to know all about the bonnets. And in rehearsal, the actors had hats and bonnets because the reality is if you're wearing one of those funnel bonnets as a woman, it changes how you interact. So it changes your physicality. And Autumn wanted to explore all that as opposed to saying, get the bonnet off, I can't see the face. So it was, you know, it was, it was a great opportunity to really go into the clothes. Well, uh, the lead Anya Taylor-Joy uh, really looks right at home in all of the, the bonnets and, and those gowns and everything. Do you have to sort of, do you ever encounter actors, you know, who need like a history lesson sort of of how this sort of period, this piece well, of clothing works? We, we all need history lessons. <laughs> and, and, but that's what's amazing. I, you know, when I'm doing a period film, I like to research it as much as I can to really understand the period because inevitably we're storytelling. So you have to select the information that is relevant. And I think to be free to do that, you need to know everything you can about it so that you're making informed choices. So for me, by the time you get to a fitting, um, I usually make mood boards and I've discussed those with, with Autumn, with Cave, with the actors. And then when you're a fitting, the actor has already started rehearsals probably, or is meeting with, with Autumn or is having dancing lessons or something, you know. So it's the beginning of, of everybody's different pieces of information coming together. And on this film in particular, you know, Emma has a lot of clothes. She's, she's very, she's a, you know, big fish in a small pond. And I wanted to show that. So she has, it's as if she has the Netta Porter account. She has clothes that are right for every occasion, every season, every moment. And because the joy of this piece was that there were no stunt doubles or any riding doubles. So everything was a one-off. And we created a kind of a wardrobe for Emma which meant that we could build up the look of a costume with all the component parts. And I think people often think Regency for women, it's a muslin dress and that's all there is, but, but there's not. There's a chemise, there's a corset. Then there's a little, um, they call them chemisettes, a little infill. Then there's the petticoat. And because the dresses are so sheer, you can change the color of a muslin dress by the color of the petticoat. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the dress, then you've got the jacket, then you've got the gloves, the jewelry, the bonnet. All those things and the shoes that go together and you can you can change the balance or the feel of a costume just by putting different accessories together and you know on a filming day I would know what the plot would be but then when Anya had rehearsed on set and came back to finish dressing we could change little pieces because of how she felt she wanted to play into or out of the scene so it was um it was very collaborative it was very spontaneous it was sometimes quite dangerous but um <laughs> You know, it was a very exciting film to work on. I think what what stands out to me most about it, um, about the costumes, is the the use of color. It, it, everyone just pops so much. There's these bright pastels, and it creates a very vibrant world uh, to live in. Where where did that sort of choice of those colors come from? Um, it it kind of came from many directions. In talking to Autumn and describing how I felt Emma's wardrobe would, should work we decided to create a seasonal palette. So it all takes place for stories over one year. So we, I made a color book for each season. So that dictated Emma's world. And then I worked with Cave because there's the kind of the color play of 
does somebody belong in this space or are they at odds with the space? So Cave and I worked very closely with those colors. And then um, there are the color combinations and the brightness really came both from the fashion engravings of the period. It was the beginning of, of having women's magazines. So there were fashion prints and uh, a lot of people have seen them. They're colored engravings and they're quite vivid in their color. And you think, oh, that's, that's strong. But then the combination of going to the museums and looking at original pieces. And when you look at parts that haven't been exposed to the sun, you can see that their colors were really strong and they were fabulous combinations. Autumn talked about it being a kind of, you know, like sugared macaroons. And I got a bit nervous because pastels are not my, they're not my comfort zone. <laughs> but actually when you really start to look at it, um, you know, Emma's first costume when she's going to uh, the wedding, she's wearing pink and yellow, which, you know, sounds like a sort of Battenberg disaster. <laughs> but actually it's about finding the right shades of those colors. And once you've got onto that, then it's actually, it's quite, it's quite, it's great. It's quite trippy, it's quite brave. You know, you can really put all these colors together and diffuse them through the muslin. So, um, and Autumn was, she was so strong on the color. She really wanted everything to have a vibrancy. I think people, again, we quite often think about period to do with antiquity and things are faded and sepia, but they weren't. They, they had a, an amazing mm. sense of color in the, the 19th century. Yeah, I think that uh, her yellow coat especially became very sought after. Yeah. There were people trying to make their own version of yeah. Emma's yellow coat on the internet. Did you see any of those? Think, yeah, no, I haven't seen that. Somebody did mention to me. I, but again, I think what I found was that um, the fabrics are actually quite simple. And it's really about, um, I feel that, you know, colors, belong with textures or fabrics. Mm. So that yellow wouldn't work in a certain fabric. So there was a, a, quite a lot of trial and error of finding the right shade. And I think that one, it's a very strong color, but also the, the cut of the coat has that kind of uh, sun ray pleat on the back, which just makes you think of, you know, sunshine and the yellow. And it, it all adds up to, to the, the balance of the, the right combination. Um, and the other thing about the clothes that I've found looking at the museums, because there were the fashion plates, women could actually find images and this, is get, with, this would be the fashion. But what was interesting looking at the real clothes is that um, they're homemade. So how, how the interpretation or how the final garment turned out depended on your skills, sewing, your money, your ability to understand the pattern. And it was the clothes that still exist are incredibly flimsy. They didn't have machine overlockers or fusing or anything like that. They're just kind of whipped edges. So these, these clothes are incredibly fragile, but quite ornate. And that, that balance, um, I really tried to stick to so that they didn't become overblown and over costumey, that they maintain that kind of um, naivety and kind of spontaneity, which I think is very much in, in the flavor of the book. Yeah, I think the costumes uh, for me helped. Uh, I know Autumn described it as an, an escape film that we sort of need after this uh, this crazy year we're in, and the sort of vibrant colors helped that. Was that something that you um, that you had I in mind? I didn't know it was going to be an escape film. I do look back on it now and think. I mean, actually, it's interesting. You know, we're all struggling with working under COVID protocol, and um, I look back at Emma and. Yes, of course, the film could be made now, but it, it wouldn't be the same film. It was such a kind of um, intimate collaboration with everybody, with the actors, with all the crew, with everybody. And we were all firing on ideas together in, in, in a spontaneous way. And there's something about, you know, masks and protocols and all that kind of thing that just step you back from it all. And um, it would be a very different film. And, I'm not saying it would be better or worse, but it's very interesting to reflect on that now in these times. Yeah. Is there, I know you have done things not necessarily, um, you know, sort of bucking the trend of being period historically accurate. Um, like with Mary Queen of Scots, you had this uh, great lineup of denim based denim, clothing. Denim, denim, yeah. Um, <laughs> so what is your thoughts like, is there ever, was there an instance in Emma where you thought, well, oh, this color isn't maybe historically accurate, but story-wise, I really need it. What are your thoughts around that? Gosh, that's a, that's a hard question. I think um, 
I don't know is the answer. I think when you're in a project, when you've done your research and your mood boards and you've had all the meetings, in a way you're, you're I find that I'm just firing so much on instinct that um, I don't, I just have to trust myself. And sometimes I'm not even sure if they, you know, yes, you know which colors they had in terms of natural dyes and aniline dyes and, and, and period for that kind of thing. But I think one gets so involved in telling the story that providing you know the rules you're breaking, there is a justification in, in doing that in terms of the story. And I do think, I actually learned it on the first Elizabeth film that I did with Shaker. Um, I think color is one of the, the best storytelling devices that we have because it is a kind of subliminal signposting or guiding of the audience's um, just instinctive response to something or how you're grouping things or alienating people. It's, it's um, I love it. I love color. And, and on Emma, we, we were able to set up a textile department. So as I said, the fabrics are very simple, but we did create a lot of the fabrics. We were obviously endlessly dying to get the right color, but we were printing. Um, and we just, we could then really play with palette and texture. Yeah. One of the really interesting things I about your career for me too, is that so much of your career is based in these historical dramas. And then the other half uh, delves into the Marvel been Cinematic been Universe. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and those are period dramas and, and uh, big comic book action films are basically my two favorites. So I'm, I'm your perfect crossover fan. Uh, <laughs> but what- Actually in that vein, I do think Doctor Strange was probably the perfect meeting of the two worlds actually, of all the, of all the superhero yeah. films. Um, it, it was the kind of the coming together of the worlds for me. Is there something from uh, your sort of research and expertise in period work that crosses over to to a superhero film like that? Um, only in that it's uh, it's storytelling. Your your research material is different. You're either in museums or you're you're reading comics, but but you are there to to tell a visual story. Um, and there's inevitably a crossover because because that's how we learn and how we grow. You know, it's um, uh, Knightley is wearing in Emma. He's wearing buckskin breeches, which I've looked at in many museums and they're quite incredible how they're made and for us to recreate them is it's quite difficult because the the leather doesn't quite have the memory you want it to have when they've sat on a horse and it all starts to look a bit baggy and a bit sad but um on the superhero films we uh, developed a technique of having um a stretch fuse where you fuse leather to lycra and it gives it just that kind of that stretch memory and a and a better behavior so one could say that Johnny Flynn as Knightley is wearing superhero britches, which are really period buckskin britches. So there are technical things that you learn, particularly on you know, the superhero films, you really, really learn about movement, you know, how, to, how people have got to be able to move um, in every way possible. And that, that does translate into every film you do and vice versa, so there are some period things that translate into the superheroes. It's just about, uh, you know, we're not making even a period film. We're not making museum pieces. We are telling a story. We are creating sophisticated dressing up to tell a story. Well, that's a wonderful way to, to end it there. So I thank you everyone for watching. If you're watching out there, subscribe to Gold Derby. Make sure you keep up to date with us throughout the season. And Alexandra, thank you so much for sitting with me. Sam, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.